Hey everyone, it is Brian here at Red Leaf, and I know it's been a minute since I've made a video. I've been really busy with everything that's been going on with TikTok, and it's kind of taken away from everything that I can do here on YouTube. But today I am so excited. I have finally completed my 2022 garden plan. I even took it a step further and illustrated it because I just love, love, love to visualize what I have in my mind and bring it to life on paper. So I have a really good idea of what I hope the garden will look like this year. So in this video, I actually wanna walk you guys through my garden plan and talk over my decisions and why I grouped plants the way that I did and really the overall feel that I'm going for in the garden this year. So before I get into the garden plan, some of you may be asking, why even do a garden plan? Well, I think a garden plan is super, super helpful so you know exactly how much room you have to work with and it really helps you plan out what you're going to plant so you know how much of each plant you need to get or plant ahead of time and how to prepare your garden for optimal success. So making a garden plan is really, really helpful and a lot of fun, especially in the dreary winter months. It's a really great way to get inspired and excited for the new season. Very quickly, I just wanna walk you guys through how I actually went about making my garden plan. Um, I actually brought my garden plan into Photoshop and individually brushed in every single spot where my plants are going to go. Um, I had a friend that came over with a drone and he was actually able to fly overhead and he took a picture of the garden and with that, I was able to make a map and a blueprint of the garden. And even before that step, even before bringing it into Photoshop, I had just a blank slate like this. And I just played around in my head and went from bed to bed and wrote in ideas of what I wanted to go in each bed. So for the center bed, I would write like peppers and okra. Over here, I would be like potatoes. Over here, I wanted brassicas, you know, things like that. Um, and it just kind of allowed me to brainstorm and get a really good sense of where I wanted things to go before getting really in-depth in Photoshop and generating the, the true, true garden plan. Awesome, that was simple enough. For the actual garden plan, I wanna walk you guys through my illustration. It'll be a lot more fun that way. <laughs> Alrighty, here we go. Um, <laughs> I had so much fun making this year's garden plan. I, I really wanted to add a lot of color, a lot of flowers, and just a lot of life in the garden. I learned so much from the garden last year, and. You know, I learned a lot of lessons and it really helped shape a lot of the decisions that I made in the garden this year. Now, if you don't know, permaculture heavily influences everything that I do in the garden. You know, I want things to feel as natural as possible. I never want to spray any pesticides. You know, I want to invite the natural world into the garden so that it can thrive the way nature intended. So again, without spraying anything in the garden, my real goal here is to create a biodiverse ecosystem so that wildlife can come in and balance itself out the way it does in nature. All righty, here we go. Now, as you can see, there is a lot going on here, which is ideal. I want a lot to be happening in the garden. Last year, I learned so many valuable lessons and it really helped shape a lot of the decisions that I made in the garden this year. And if you don't know, I am heavily influenced by permaculture and regenerative farming and gardening really the way nature intended us to garden, working with the natural landscape, working in harmony with nature's creatures and wildlife so that it can thrive. Our garden can thrive the way nature intended. So I planted a really, really wide diversity of plants in the garden to help establish a biodiverse ecosystem. And when you establish a biodiverse ecosystem within the garden, a natural hierarchy uh, comes into play within the garden and you have, you know, birds, larger insects, critters, um, as smaller insects, our pollinators, and they all balance each other out within the garden. So it really thrives, again, the way nature wants it to thrive, the way nature is meant to thrive. Before diving into the actual vegetable garden, I do want to note that my partner Dominic is also a really incredible gardener. I have learned so much from him. And there's actually an entire perennial garden on the very outer edge of the vegetable garden. 
and here he just has pure creative reign. He plays so much with planting a wide variety of flowers and shrubs and grasses and trees. Um, and it's really of benefit to the garden because what it does is it invites even more wildlife into the garden. And we really get to see this beautiful orchestra of wildlife play out throughout the season. Um, now, one of my main goals within the vegetable garden was actually to incorporate even more flowers this year. I had so much fun planting flowers last year and I'm like, this year I have to make it a staple in the garden. I want flowers everywhere. And planting them strate strategically throughout the garden will only be of benefit to the vegetables for a variety of reasons. For example, let's get right into our center bed here. Here, I'm gonna be planting peppers, uh, okra, zinnias, marigolds, and sprinkling in onions as well. Now, there is a lot going on in this, gar in this bed, and that is exactly what I want. I want every single bed to have a life of its own, essentially. Now, there are a lot of really famous groupings of plants um, known as companion planting, uh, where you plant a mixture of plants together and they actually help each other out um, and form kind of a symbiotic relationship so that they can all grow as effectively as possible. Um, there are some very well-known ones um, and we'll get to those in a minute, but this bed is pretty experimental. Once you kind of get an understanding of the role certain plants can play in a garden, you figure out ways of incorporating it with other plants to see how they um, connect with one another and, and, inf and influence one another. I would really consider this center bed very experimental. Um, last year I did grow peppers and okra together and they did really, really well. Um, I will say though, my okra did get ravaged quite a bit by Japanese beetle. So I'm very hopeful that the zinnias and that the marigolds will actually help repel those Japanese beetles, but also bring in some beneficial predatory insects um, to help control other pests in the garden as well. So very excited to see how everything plays out. This year, I'm really trying to plant a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of peppers. I planted like maybe eight to 10 varieties last year. I'm going well into like 16 varieties this year. So this center bed is gonna be heavily dedicated to peppers uh, more than anything. And my Jing orange okra, very excited to see how that does. Um, with the okra, really, um, last year I had fun growing it. I really love it as an ornamental plant. If you don't know, okra is actually related to hibiscus. So they have these beautiful, beautiful flowers. And then after they flower, they produce those famous seed pods. Um, that we eat. So very excited to see how that does, especially the Jing orange variety. It's going to be very vibrant, very colorful, and we're going to have vibrant zinnias like intermingled through this bed as well. So very excited to see how that plays out. Um, I didn't really get a chance to draw much of them, much of them into the garden plan, or at least the illustrated version, but there's actually going to be a lot of onions intermingled here as well. Onions are just great to have in the garden, you know, they're a staple in the kitchen, <clears throat> but they also act as a really good repellent as well. So I'm literally going to be intermingling onions all over this garden. Now, um, right here on the far corner of the garden, the bottom right here, um, it's going to mimic a lot of what's going on in this bed. More peppers um, and more zinnias with marigolds and onions as well. So we're going to have all the peppers. I cannot wait. They are so much fun to grow and so much fun to play with in the kitchen. Now we'll segue over to the left here. And here we actually have um, a row of two apple trees that my partner Dominic is espaliering. Um, espaliering is when you train the branches of a tree in a certain direction, either horizontally or upwards. Now with the long narrow branches and leaves here, it's gonna cast a lot of shade underneath, directly underneath this bed. So I'll be utilizing that shaded area to grow some cool crops, plants that actually appreciate the shade and will definitely appreciate the shade in the hot summer months like uh, Swiss chard and a new plant that I'm growing this year called strawberry spinach with really uh, cool looking edible leaves, but they also produce a red fruit. Um, and I'm excited to try it. They say it's delicious. So really curious to see how that all does in there. Um, at the very bottom of this bed, I'm gonna be growing our famous zucchini rampicante. Um, I'm taking it off the arch that I grew off last year. 
And <clears throat> I, I really just wanted to like crawl through the bed and see how that does. Um, and to prevent pests like squash beetle, I'm gonna be intermingling a border of uh, nasturtiums, um, which is a great companion plant in the garden. Um, it helps repel a lot of pests that we don't want in the garden, but they also attract a lot of beneficial insects like ladybugs, which are very famous for preying on aphids, which are a very common issue in a lot of gardens. So very excited to see how this plays out here. Venturing upward um, on the far uh, <clears throat> end of this bed, I'm going to have chrysanthemums that I planted last year and lavender that I planted last year as well. So this is kind of like a perennial herb area that's happening on this far end. Um, and yeah, we'll see how that plays out. Speaking of herbs, as we venture down here to the bottom left of the garden, I have rosemary bushes growing in this bed that are absolutely massive. They have really made it their home and they're huge and I don't want to move them. Um, so I literally will have a never ending supply of rosemary here and some silver leaf lavender as well. And last year, oh my God, last year, um, this is supposed to be a clary sage here. <laughs> and last year, um, it is a biennial plant. So every other year it flowers. And last year was the second year that I had it in the garden and it just exploded. I did not realize how big clary sage got. It got six feet tall, six feet tall. And that was just so crazy to see. Um, well over six feet tall and beautiful flower spikes. It smelled incredible. One of my favorite things that happened in the garden last year um, not, I don't think it's going to flower this year. Again, it's every other year that it flowers. So as it just like lays low and grows its leaves, I'm going to have it growing here on the edge. Um, but there is going to be a lot of negative space in the center of this bed. So I'm going to be planting some sun king, uh, some double sun king sunflowers, which should, which should add a nice layer of height, um, invite some pollinators in and it should just look really beautiful there just to utilize that negative space. Cause I really just want this to be more focused on my herbs. Now, if we venture north of this bed, we have my cabbage patch. Now, something I really want in the garden this year, you know, you can see there's a lot going on. Last year, I would say, I mean, the garden was beautiful, but it was quite blocky in the sense that things were very organized in rows um, and, and blocks of plants. And that was very beautiful. Um, but this year, I really want to have a much more wild landscape, a much more natural feel in the garden for a variety of reasons. One, again, to really help encourage that biodiversity, um, to really help encourage that ecosystem to establish itself in the garden. Um, and two, really to help control the, the, the pest populations in the garden as well, um, you know. When you plant things in big blocks, like for example, a big block of corn or a big uh, patch of cabbages, what happens is, you know, the way pests or insects overall are attracted to plants are really through scent. They smell plants before they actually see them. They can smell plants uh, from much further away before they actually see it, right? So if you intermingle and interplant a lot of different plants around certain crops, it could essentially blind pests or make it really hard to find the crop that they're so used to looking for because there's so many different scents going on. So if I have a wide diversity of things going on in the garden and in this bed specifically, my little cabbage patch here, I feel like it's gonna be really hard for um, the cabbage butterfly, um, the layer of the dreaded cabbage worm that we experience so much here. It'll be, it'll be more difficult for it to find the cabbage because there's gonna be a lot going on here. Um, I'm only planting three cabbages last year. I planted like six last year. Did not need that many. Um, I'll be planting three. And within the negative space of the cabbage, um, I'll be interplanting leafy greens like mizuna, um, sorrel, um, another variety of brassica called tot soy, um, geraniums, nasturtiums, and dill as well. Um, nasturtiums, uh, dill, and geraniums are known to repel uh, cabbage butterfly, cabbage worm, and other pests in the garden while attracting some beneficial insects as well. So very excited to see how this plays out this year. It's gonna be a lot of fun. I'm gonna be planting my uh, Violaceo di Verona cabbage, which is so, so, so beautiful. Gets really big green, dark green foliage with like 
pink veins. It's, it's a really, really stunning cabbage. Excited to see how it does this year. And I'm actually going to be direct planting a lot of my uh, uh, early winter crop this year rather than starting it indoors and then transplanting it. Um, I don't feel like there's a lot of time in between starting them indoors and transplanting them outdoors um, for me to harden them off in between that time to have them settle appropriately. Like if I just plant them directly outside, they're already going to be growing in the outside conditions. They'll be hardy already. So I might as well just plant them outside. So that'll, that I'll start planting my, my early season crop, like my brassicas, my leafy greens, uh, my carrots and things like that um, in mid-March. So in just a few weeks, really, actually like less than two weeks, like 10 days. Now further upward, very excited for this bed here. Um, I was speaking earlier on companion planting. A very famous grouping of plants known as the Three Sisters um, is where you plant corn, pole beans, and squash together. It's a very famous planting method cultivated by um, Native Americans, and I'm very excited to be dedicating this bed to that pairing here. So it's really beautiful to see what happens when you plant the Three Sisters together. Um, I plant corn, I'm going to be planting corn in a mound here, as you can see. Um, I'm going to let the corn get about a foot tall before I plant my beans, my pole beans, and the pole beans should just climb up the tall stalks of the corn and use them as support. Now their relationship is really interesting because, you know, corn is very, very, or is a very heavy feeder. They, they feed heavily on nitrogen within the soil. And beans and legumes are very famous because they fix nitrogen in the soil. So they kind of create a really nice cycle here of fixing nitrogen and consuming it. Um, so it really balances itself out there, which is nice. Um, and once the beans are established and the corn is getting nice and tall, that is when I will plant my squash about four feet away from the mound. I'm going to be planting a blue Hubbard squash, with them, which I'm very excited to see. Very beautiful fruit and the squash should just kind of crawl and sprawl throughout the bed. And because they have these big leaves, um, they're just going <clears> to <throat> shade the soil, um, which protects the soil um, from the harsh UV rays, which in turn protects the microorganisms with, which, within the soil. And it also helps retain even more moisture in the soil because the direct sunlight isn't uh, making it evaporate nearly as quickly. So that'll be the Three Sisters play that I have going on in this bed. And I'll also be interplanting some carrots, some nasturtiums, and some marigolds as well for that uh, natural pest repellent um, and just to establish some more biodiversity in this bed. So that's very exciting. Continuing upward. Here I have this little uh, really tall container that I made out of galvanized uh, tin roofing that I found on the property. It's about three, maybe three and a half feet tall, uh, really high off the ground. Um, and I've actually kind of cracked the code with planting eggplants. Um, the first year of gardening that I had, um, I planted eggplants at ground level in this bed over here, actually. And what ended up happening is we have flea beetle, heel flea beetle here pretty bad. And they are heavily attracted to eggplants. So my eggplant was just getting like ravaged by flea beetle. There were so many holes in my leaves. Um, and in an effort to combat them, I actually built an entire tent around this bed to shield my eggplant. But by the time I planted the bed, um, the flea beetle had already pretty established, had established itself pretty well in this bed. So I ended up just making like a little house for them and their population just exploded even more. And it was a disaster. Um, I did get a little bit, a few eggplants, but I know I didn't get nearly as many as I could have because they were super stunted by the damage of the flea beetle. Now, as the name suggests, flea beetles are hoppers. They navigate through their life by hopping around everywhere, right? So what I really like about these tall containers is it's really hard for the flea beetle to get there because they can't jump that high. So last year I planted eggplant in this container over here and it did so well, I hardly saw any flea beetle on my eggplant. So I figured that is the only way I'm gonna plant eggplant from now on. So I'm gonna be planting eggplant in this bed again, along with some thyme, which also helps repel a variety of pests in the garden. Now to the right of this bed and in the far back of the garden, we are going to have this amazing wall of tomatoes. 
Now, I planted tomatoes in this bed last year and they just did so, 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 so well. Like it was just a wall of juicy fruit. It's very common um, to speak on rotating crops in the garden. I feel like rotating crops is more beneficial when it comes to like planting a massive scale um, of a single plant, for example, like if it's a monoculture um, of corn, you know, it's, it's, there's a much higher chance of problems arising within the soil if there's only one plant um, growing within that area, right? Of course, there's going to be a higher risk of soil-borne diseases to manifest if there's only one plant there. But if there is, um, in a smaller scale garden, you know, I don't necessarily feel like the threat is that high, especially if you're interplanting a wider variety of plants. Um, so I don't think pushing it an extra year and planting tomatoes in this bed again um, is going to cause any serious issues. Um, and this year I'm really going overboard with the tomatoes. I, I planted eight varieties of tomatoes this year. Um, I'm going to try and go for, I think I have 12 to 16 varieties growing right now in the greenhouse. So we're going to see how the tomatoes do. Very excited. Planting a lot of new varieties, uh, but bringing back some favorites like my Abe Lincoln tomato and my pineapple tomato. I just loved those last year. They produced massive fruit. And in the front of the tomatoes, I'm going to be interplanting basil, uh, carrots, and asters as well. Um, so I feel like there, there's just going to be a beautiful, diverse grouping of plants here, and it should be abundant and productive. Let's see what happens. Now, in the very center of the garden, we have our beautiful, famous arch that I made out of cattle panels. Um, I did plant a kiwi, a male and female kiwi plant on this end of the arch here. Um, it didn't do that well last year. I feel like it's, it's gonna take some time for it to really settle and establish, but this year I'm really just gonna let it be because I would really just love for the hardy kiwi to grow over the arch and make it its permanent home as a perennial plant. So year after year, we get some juicy kiwi fruit. Um, with kiwi plants, you need both the male and female plant for it to cross pollinate and produce fruit. So I'm happy when I bought it, it had both already. So hopefully this year it really takes off. Um, <clears throat> and just to keep it simple on the arch, I don't want to interplant too much on the side of the kiwi. So I'm just gonna plant some uh, scarlet, or actually no, I'm gonna be planting my Chinese python bean on the far edges of uh, the arch to crawl over. And they produce like really, really long pods. Um, they're really crazy looking, so I'm very excited to see how that does. Um, and that's just gonna grow over to the opposite end where I will have um, a Japanese variety of cucumber um, growing as well. In this bed here, I tried growing cucumber and sour gherkin. Cucumbers here with oh, that wall of sunflowers that I had but I actually just learned after the fact that sunflowers can actually pull a lot of nutrients from the soil, but they can also release a chemical within the soil that makes it difficult for other plants to grow around it. Like, oh my gosh, I wish I knew that beforehand, otherwise I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> so because of that, I'm actually just dedicating a singular area to the sunflowers over here, where I won't be planting much else around it except other sunflowers and some flowers. Um, so there's going to be a beautiful mound of, a beautiful wall of sunflowers here, very excited. We're bringing back the good old Mongolian sunflower, going to be planting a Titan sunflower and a wall of, what are they called, uh, chocolate cherry sunflowers for some nice, nice color. They don't grow nearly as tall as the Mongolian or the Titan one, so it should be a nice layering effect there. And at the very base, I'll probably have some marigolds. Venturing further right, I'm going to have a, another wall of sunflowers here. Um, I really like growing this wall of sunflower here, sunflowers here um, because my chicken coop's right here. And they cast some really much needed shade into the chicken coop, especially during the hot summer months. So my chickens really appreciate it. I love growing so many sunflowers so that there's enough sunflower seed for all the wildlife, some for my chickens and some for us too. And at the base of the sunflowers, I actually have some perennial herbs like lavender, rosemary, sage, um, and oregano. Further north of the chicken coop, I made a little half rain barrel bed up here for some perennial flowers um, and annual flowers. It was a lot of fun to experiment and play with it there. But having learned how well a raised situation does for my eggplants, I'm going to be planting eggplants there in front of our sunflower shed, along with some thyme and chamomile. 
So very excited to see how it does. It gets a lot of sunlight here. So the eggplant should be doing very well there. We have my garlic patch here, which I planted in mid-November. So that should be ready to harvest in mid-July. If you guys don't know, garlic takes about eight to nine months to grow. And it's the only thing that I plant in the winter because um, it grows it over winter as well. So be very grateful when you eat your garlic because it took a really long time for it to grow. Um, to the left of the garlic, I'm gonna have a really nice long line of brassicas. Here we're gonna have cauliflower, broccoli, um, purple cauliflower and white cauliflower and broccoli. Um, and, you know, saying, I'm very, very adamant about not spraying any pesticides in the garden ever. I don't wanna do that, it disturbs so many natural cycles in the garden, not to mention if you spray pesticides, it can leach into the soil, which then, which affects the ecosystem underneath the soil, like our microorganisms, our worms, our fungi, and even further, it ventures and seeps into groundwater, which will then seep into lakes and rivers, and we really just don't want that. Like, we do enough damage to the environment as humanity. Um, the goal of this garden is to cultivate nature, not destroy it. Um, so I'm not gonna be spraying anything, so as a more uh, traditional tactic, I'm actually going to be building a little hoop house over this bed to combat cabbage worm because it was so bad last year I did, I, that I didn't get any broccoli um, or cauliflower. So I'm just going to build a hoop house here early in the season um, so that all that can grow in there. Uh, and I'll also be interplanting some beans to help fix nitrogen in the soil because brassicas are heavy nitrogen feeders. Also going to be interplanting some dill and some geraniums as well. So lots going on in this bed, but it should be really fun to watch play out. Now, hopping over the hoop house, we have these three very big center beds here. On the outer edges, I'm gonna be planting uh, a variety of squash. How do I even pronounce this? Pardon me if I botch it, but it's quite an interesting name. Um, the Gelber Anglisher Custard Squash. Um, a bush variety of squash, so it should stay pretty compact and in place. Um, shouldn't vine and grow all over the place and take over the garden. Um, also interplanting some marigolds to help repel pests like squash bug um, and some beans as well to help fix nitrogen in the soil because um, squash can be pretty, uh, pretty hungry eaters. They eat a lot. Um, mimicking what's happening in this bed over here with another bush variety of uh, zucchini, um, a long white Palermo zucchini. Also interplanting with marigolds and uh, beans. Very excited to see how this plays out here. I've never planted squash in this area, bush squash. Um, they're very nice, deep, fluffy, rich beds, so I feel like they should do really well. In the very center of this area, I'm gonna be planting potatoes. Oh my gosh, last year I planted potatoes back here um, underneath a tent of beans, and that didn't really go so well because I didn't realize, they were red cranberry beans. I didn't realize how big red cranberry beans got compared to the other beans I've grown in the garden before and they literally took over this entire area of the garden and completely shaded my potatoes. So they didn't do that well, um, so much so that I don't, I didn't even get any potatoes last year. Well, I hardly got any potatoes, they were so small. Here they'll be fully exposed to the sun, um, very nice loose soil in this raised bed and I have been amending the soil for so long now, like three years. Um, that the clay soil underneath has actually gotten really soft, really loose, and very airy as well. So I don't see the potatoes having any problems uh, growing there. Um, also interplanting some nasturtiums to help repel pests, some dill to help repel pests, and also interplanting kale, a Jagalo narrow kale. Um, apparently potatoes and kale can grow well together. Um, so I'm curious to see how that plays out. All right, so I think that pretty much covers the front part of the garden. Oh, wait, I wanted to, I didn't even talk about it over here. Uh, I have another container here that's pretty nice and high off the ground. Gonna plant more eggplants there. And in the corner here, it's kind of hard to see. I'm gonna plant a Kiko, I think it's called a Kiku Chrysanthemum Melon. A beautiful, uh, smaller white melon. Um, very curious to see how it tastes, but I'm gonna plant it here so that it can actually train itself along the fence post and create a beautiful wall of leaves um, and flowers and melons. So let's see what happens there. This back bed over here, I am so excited about. So as you walk through the arch, you'll be greeted by a beautiful pathway that will be covered and bursting with wildflowers. 
talking about, you know, inviting wildlife in and having a more natural feel in the garden, I want it to feel pretty wild. So there's going to be a lot of interplanting and mixing in just like random sporadic ways. Not very organized, which is great. I want it to feel random. Um, but I'm going to be planting essentially like a little meadow of wildflowers back here. Um, and interplanted within the, 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 the wildflowers, I'll have some kales, maybe some peppers. I'm going to have more groupings of corn for a nice like tall layering effect um, with beans and just a wide variety of other flowers intermingled in there, like uh, red clo a crimson clover, uh, more chrysanthemums, some straw flowers, um, zinnias, dahlias. Like there's gonna be so much going on here. I cannot wait to see how it looks. Um, and in the very far back, I have two beautiful trellises that I had growing here last year with my loofah gourds. I'm gonna place them in the far back of the garden to kind of cap the garden off and create a beautiful wall of uh, jelly melons and sour gherkin cucumbers. You know, it'll be filled with beautiful foliage, nice vibrant yellow flowers, and tons of juicy fruit. I cannot wait to see how it all looks coming together. Um, and then to the left, on this far end here, I actually planted a mulberry tree here last year, um, really on a whim. Like I was just so inspired to plant a mulberry tree because it was a fruiting tree. It's an ever-bearing mulberry tree, so it gets about 20 feet tall, not too tall um, for a tree. Um, and within permaculture, there's this concept called gilding, or creating a guild, um, which is an everlasting community of perennial plants, um, some fruiting, some not, so that essentially you don't have to tend to this area nearly as much because all of these plants are gonna do a great job of taking care of themselves. Um, for example, you know, at the end of the fall, the leaves of the mulberry will fall and feed life back into the soil here. I also have a mulberry, or an elderberry, pardon me, an elderberry growing here, which is a native plant to help uh, invite wildlife in, give some wildlife some good food to eat, and again, their foliage will fall and feed life into the soil. Um, in the very front, I'll have milkweed um, and comfrey, uh, milkweed to invite some of our native butterflies in, and. and a, a plethora of pollinators and the comfrey is a really amazing plant because it's essentially a powerhouse um, fertilizing plant in the garden. It has really nutrient dense leaves because it has a really deep tap root that ventures deep underground and pulls nutrients up um, that a lot of other plants can't access because they don't have that deep of a tap root. Um, so because of that, because it stores so much nutrients in the leaves, um, Gardeners that like to do things the more natural route, the more organic route, use their leaves. They harvest the leaves and they just like lay them in beds so that they can break down naturally over time and feed the soil. Or they harvest it and throw it in their compost. This is my compost back here for a nice uh, boost to their compost. Um, in the back, um, I'm, I'm also going to have some uh, boysenberries and some gooseberries growing as, as well. So. Year after year, this, this little guild that I'm experimenting with um, should just get better and better. Um, this is really a guild of my own creation. Um, I don't feel like there's, there are some like more like, this is a very effective guild. It's been proven to be effective guild. Um, but I'm just kind of winging it and experimenting and finding, you know, my own flow with a guild. Um, as you can see, I'm experimenting a lot in this garden. I'm having so much fun in this garden because every single year I want to experiment and learn. Like there is bound to be abundance. That is, there's no doubt in my mind I will have abundance in the garden. But what I'm most excited to see every single year is the song, the rhythm, the music that nature plays every single year in the garden. And as gardeners, as creators, once we understand the connections that can happen between plants, we are the orchestrators. We are the composers of what can happen in our garden. So I'm very excited to see how everything plays out. One more thing I do want to mention is that I'm also gonna be planting a lot of native plants in here as well um, in this back area. This whole bed here is actually dedicated to native plants. Um, in this very far corner. We have some bee balm, native geraniums, native grasses, because I just wanna cultivate our native wildlife, our wildlife altogether, because 
again, as gardeners, as creators, I feel like we have a responsibility to do so, to harmonize with nature rather than push it out, inviting her in so that our gardens, our lives can thrive the way nature intended. So there you have it. That is the in-depth walkthrough of my 2022 garden plan. Um, I really hope you found this inspiring and motivating and exciting. And I hope it inspires you to get out there and draw up a garden plan and experiment and play and find ways to cultivate your own, your own garden. Are you still with me? <laughs> I hope so. I know that was deep and extensive. Thank you for, I guess, just paying attention throughout that whole video because it was a lot to cover. Um, what, something else I do want to mention is when I'm going to be planting everything. So we have our brassicas and our leafy greens and carrots. Um, potatoes, you know, the root vegetables, um, those I'll actually be planting here in Tennessee in mid-March. Um, so about March 15th, and I'll be direct sowing a lot of those plants. Throughout the spring season, I'll have two other waves of planting um, after our last frost here in Tennessee, which will be around mid-April. I'll do our first wave of corn and beans, um, sunflowers and squashes, and that's when I'll also be planting my transplants, the so things that I started earlier indoors, like my tomatoes, my peppers, and my eggplants. Um, usually you wanna plant those things um, after the last risk of frost. Um, and then another wave of planting in mid-May with more squashes, zucchinis, and melons, maybe another round of sunflowers and other flowers and things like that. So there'll be about three waves of planting and. If you follow me on TikTok, you'll see all of it. I'll be sharing absolutely everything. Now, if you want um, an even further breakdown of the garden plan, um, I'll link the uh, blog post where I actually typed out and wrote down everything um, so you have something more concrete to look at if you're more of a reader. Um, but with that, we have covered the 2022 garden plan. Again, I hope it inspired you guys to get out there and make your own and try some new fun things in the garden and also inspired some some planting some groupings in the garden and hopefully most importantly inspired you to do things the more natural route um, so that we can cultivate our gardens as naturally and as abundantly as possible thank you all so 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 much for watching i appreciate all of your love and support until next time take care everyone